Now we have the Honourable Damien O'Connor connecting with us from Wellington, uh, the Minister of Agriculture. Damien, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much for your time uh, and coming through into the 2021 Deer Industry Conference. Uh, Minister, we have forwarded you through some crowdsourced questions before we get to our audience questions, both on the live stream as well as here in the audience. Now, our audience, uh, you will only be allowed to ask your question if you do wait for a microphone. If we've got a couple of runners, uh, Alex has got some microphones at the back to be able to help us out with that process would be fantastic. I do already have one question from the live stream. So as I said, crowdsource from the Deer Farmers Association. Uh, Minister, let's start with a, a topic that's very close to this area at the moment with uh, some major properties going into forestry. Planting trees to offset greenhouse gas emissions uh, doesn't encourage people to reduce their carbon emissions. The government's enthusiasm for planting trees is driving this forestry conversion to the detriment of rural communities uh, that have lack lacking the uh, rural professionals and rural businesses' capability um, threatening, threatening by this blanket forestation. What is the government committed to doing to ensure that we can continue to have thriving rural communities uh, that will be of the best contribution to New Zealand and our overseas earnings as well? Uh, well, kia ora, and look, thanks very much uh, for the opportunity to say a few words. I'm happy to, to answer those questions. I just want to probably firstly acknowledge Ian um, uh, and Ennis, I guess, for the work they've done over the year, uh, working alongside um, the other leaders in the rural and, and primary sectors to I guess through COVID to ensure that actually we have um, you know, a 1% drop in total exports, which is an amazing feat uh, when the rest of the world is, is suffering huge impacts. So uh, thank you for your part in that um, and just uh, making the adjustments particularly through the processing areas um, that had meant that we haven't contributed in any way to the spread of COVID and we're now in a situation we can hopefully um, you know pick up the pieces and go forward it has been tough in the markets obviously uh, the service sectors around the world uh, where people have been locked down means that uh, the restaurants and other areas of outlet for um, you know a lot of venison of course hasn't hasn't worked at the same time we've got a, a focus back on health and uh, um, you know maybe we'll, we'll see some opportunities I guess uh, there um, for all the venison products that that you produce and the velvet course being one of them um, and, and that'll be opportunities into the future. Regarding afforestation, look, we're still about 70,000 hectares less forest now than there was in 2000 and we've seen massive levels of afforestation happen uh, through the 1990s. Um, there was a lot of deforestation and now, of course, the Billion Trees program that was rolled out under the previous government, um, you know, looked at areas that could be planted. Um, in fact, those areas were identified Identified that had virtually no or little impact on our farming sectors. But, of course, we've seen some whole farms purchased and those be planted in trees. And uh, the uh, National Environmental Standard that was negotiated for forestry did prevent or hindered the council's ability to intervene. We are reviewing that and saying that anything class five and under will will, if the councils choose, uh, will need a resource consent. And that should put local input back into, uh, I guess, forestation and areas. The, the, the reality is actually for us that, that about 89% of the land in ETS is in class six and over land. Um, so that's, that's in steep country that's pretty hard work uh, to make uh, money from, uh, even with the best of sheep. Um, at all deer. And so, look, we're mindful of that um, and we don't want to see good farmland planted in, in trees. Um, but, of course, we do have an ETS. That's been something committed to since 2008 and all governments have said that that's the way forward. Um, there are some challenges to sort out the ETS so that there aren't perverse uh, incentives in there for land use change. Um, but we have seen some carbon forest planting. Uh, we've seen some forests planted for trees and for wood, um, and we just make, have to make sure that it goes in the right place. Intervening and saying to someone you can't sell that land or your farm for a forest um, also has some consequences across the farming sector. So we're mindful of getting the right balance there. 
Uh, Damien, if you were present here in Invercargill, you would see the uh, <laughs> horrendous weather that we are experiencing outside this window. We've snow on the ground, and as someone mentioned, there'll be a drone in the sky tomorrow. Leading me on to my next question around winter grazing, uh, you are well aware of the concerns around how impractical uh, some of the rules are within the winter grazing, hence the reason for putting it back a year, the implementation and enforcement of this policy. Uh, so what assurance can you give the farmers uh, in the room as well as watching on Online, that any new policy will actually have some practical, well thought consultation with farmers to ensure that we get this right from an animal welfare and environmental management perspective. I mean, look, that's what we're working through now, and that'll be the process over the next nine months um, before you know the possibility that those regulations and there will have to be changes are made. As I've said, some of them were just clearly wrong; um, they were rolled out the door and maybe a little too quickly. But nonetheless, we will make those changes. The objectives, though, of course, remain in place, and that is that um, you know we want to see uh, good animal welfare standards maintained, uh, and we don't want to see you know. Uh, unnecessary loss of soil or water degradation. It is a challenge, particularly in areas like Southland, um, but some farmers can do it and some can't. Some have run higher risk situations depending on where they're farming. And we've been working over the last few months with the Regional Council, MPI, down on the ground, talking directly to farmers, just to identifying the risks and saying, how can we mitigate? Uh, it's not going to happen overnight, but we did flag the animal welfare issues um, some two years ago, of course, off the back of some some terrible um, images. We had a task force, included all local people, made the independent recommendations, and we said we'll roll those through last year. And there was because it was a dry year, which helped, um, but we saw you know a, a huge lift in practice. Um, and hopefully this year it might be too. Uh, obviously, a bit of rain doesn't help, um, but we just have to make through make sure that we we have practical um, proposals that come out of this. But we have to be mindful that you know images and whether it's a drone from friendly or unfriendly people, um, you know, those images go out around the world. And I guess if we're trying to sell high quality um, venison or um, deer products or milk or whatever, we've got to make sure that we, we can show we've got good animal welfare standards and we're looking after the environment. Because if we can't, you know, we will be struggling to get the value that we need to be viable. Uh, I just want to go to uh, the question as it ties in so nicely to carry on that from the live stream from the team at Broccoli Deer Farm who ask you, Minister, how will these RMA reforms affect the current changes around fresh water given that the RMA overlays the national policy statement and regional statements? Ha do we need to expect further impacts to the way we can farm? No, that's why the RMA has been reformed because, you know, overlay or call it what you like, one writing over the other is kind of ridiculous. What we want are the same outcomes and, and the priorities and the way that the, the regional councils have been forced to implement it haven't helped us, um, you know, whether it be, um, you know, changing land use in rural areas, um, you know, it might be buildings, it might be uh, in urban areas, um, more diversification, you know, in terms of, of housing policy and uh, intensification in Auckland, which is something I'll always advocate for. The RMA hasn't served us well. It's become quite a beast. It has been reformed to make sure that what we do with farm plans, what we do with NES, uh, and what we do through the RMA are all consistent. That's what we need. And hopefully it will um, reduce the bureaucracy that, that we have been facing. And, and we're still working on how that will happen through an integrated farm plan that will be the one you know, process we all go through um, to meet all the requirements that we have, be it, you know, health and safety, um, you know, biosecurity, animal welfare, all of those things are part and parcel of farming now. We just need to try and streamline the ability for us to show people who ask the questions. It might be the processor, it might be the regional council, it might be the vets, um, you know, that, that we're doing the right thing. And, and if we're not, that we can make the adjustments to improve it. One thing that the deer farmers in the room uh, want the same outcomes on is how we go about protecting and enhancing biodiversity, uh, something that they have celebrated for 20 years of good environmental management with the Alworthy Award and is stated in having every farm environment plan in place by 2023. These deer farmers invest their own time and money in this process, yet with the MPS on Indigenous biodiversity and Council's ability to designate areas 
areas of privately held land as significant natural areas. Uh, effectively, this will take this uh, ability to protect biodiversity on private land out of owner's control. So what assurance can you provide that farmers will be incentivized to continue to protect this for the public good and not just threaten with penalties if they don't comply? won't take them out of their hands. As you say, many, particularly in the deer industry, have, have acknowledged this and the value of having uh, biodiversity on farms for both shelter, um, just, just for all the good things that we know. And, and more often than not, it adds huge value to any farming operation and the value of, of the total enterprise. Um, it, it will, I hope, endorse the good work that the farmers um, are doing. The SNA requirements have been around for 30 years. They've been implemented in, in variable ways across the country and now there's an, an attempt to kind of move it forward and standardise it and I think that um, again being committed to biodiversity on farms and different farms is a positive thing for us when it comes to selling our produce offshore um, you know along with the water management and animal welfare standards and so I hope, and, and there's still a lot of work to be done in this area, that, that what the councils will de designate will be what the farmers um, have chosen already. Um, and then the issues of fencing and maybe some incentives, those things are still yet to be worked through. But I clearly believe um, that we should have the acknowledgement and an incentive. Some will talk about a rates, you know, um, uh, rebate for, for the area, depending on how big it is. I think, you know, those are, those are points for discussion as we go forward. The chicken and egg around meeting the fit for a better world. It was released setting ambitious goals for increasing primary sector contributions to our national economy, yet many of these policies the government are introducing are impending agriculture's ability to increase this export revenue with less money and less time to invest in the systems changes that you ask of farmers. Uh, and the substantial increase in export revenue is um, therefore... Uh, potentially um, unable to be achieved. What is being done to actually empower at the existing farmers to realise the vision of Fit for a Better World? I don't think anything we're doing is reducing the ability at all. It's, in fact, enhancing it. Um, what we are saying is that we want to get more for what we do, not just ask you to do more. Um, and, and whether, you know, there's some debates, and I'm, I'm not making judgment on, you know, whether we've got to peak cow or peak milk or peak deer or whatever. You know, those things will adjust over time. But we've probably got um, to the limits of, of capacity with some of the really intensive dairy operations. They are very efficient. They are really producing, you know, you know, a, a huge amounts of milk solids off land, and that probably won't go up further. So, in the end, the way forward has to be get it has to get more value for what they produce and what you produce now. And those are the areas that we're looking at uh, around nutrition focus. Um, it was around branding. Um, might be country of origin. It might be from New Zealand. It might be just part of Alliance or or some of the silver fern branding. Um, you know initiatives that they've put in place. But as we see, most of those processing companies require an assurance program, um, and, and that is part of the value-add proposition. So Fit for a Better World does have a target of getting more export dollars, but that's not just producing more volume. That's actually getting more volume for what we do now. Um, Take apples, you know, you've got the small apples that used to be ditched now under rocket, of course, are a major export earner for us. We do require some lateral thinking. Um, and, and I, you know, be it organic milk, um, be it uh, other areas of, of production, pasture fed, um, which is clearly gaining recognition internationally. All of those things provide an opportunity for us to get more value for what we do. As I say, not just to sell more, uh, but get more for what we sell. Turning now to trade, Minister, one of your other portfolios, uh, the deer farmers would like to know how close we are in achieving a free trade agreement with the UK and in particular the EU, given New Zealand's aspiration for liberalisation on agricultural trade. <laughs> Um, look, it's really important, and they were, you know, the EU, which included the UK, of course, a really important market, and um, particularly for this sector. Um, and of course, Brexit's kind of divided that up, and so 
we haven't had a free trade agreement per se. We've had historical arrangements um, and they've worked well for us. So we're now having to negotiate and formalise those. We're a lot further ahead with the EU. In fact, I spoke with the um, Irish um, uh, Agricultural Minister this morning. Um, that, that's an economy similar to ours, focused on livestock protein production. Uh, they're having the same challenges around climate change, their commitments there, around water quality, around the, you know, a bit of a resistance to livestock protein that we're seeing around the world. They see it internally in Ireland and they see it in their markets just as we are. Um, so we, we have to, I guess, reach agreement with the EU. They've had a deal with Mercosur and clearly they reference back to that uh, in, in some occasions as we move forward. Um, we want a, an agreement that is good quality and we're not going to rush it, but we would like to think that we'll be close to conclusion by the end of this year. The same thing uh, with the UK, although we, we've only had four rounds of negotiations, um, I will be going um, over to the UK to meet with the Minister, both of Agriculture and, and, and of um, Trade, actually in Brussels as well, just to kind of push through with some of the niggly things, the sensitive issues, which do include agriculture. Um, we... we aren't locked into anything, but we do want a really good deal in the end. And we're not going to rush it um, just to say that we've got a deal. We want to hold out for a good quality one that gives us real progress. And I think we've we've done that, certainly with CPTPP, we've got real progress in some of those markets. So we have good negotiators. Um, we'll hold the line, um, uh, but we, we hope that by the end of the year, um, because the UK certainly wants to move forward quickly, the EU um, probably not not as much enthusiasm, but we're a long way further down the track, um, and they see the value in connecting to to a country like ours. That actually, you know, we walk the talk. You know, we are doing things around animal welfare that they aspire to. We are committing to good environmental management, and something that does excite them is, is to say we're looking at including agriculture in our emissions uh, reduction plan, and they are trying to get that rolled out. Um, they've they've talked about it. They haven't worked out how to do it. Um, but they are using us as a, as a bit of a benchmark for that. So, again, it's an opportunity, um, as I've said before, to be the best country for the world to show through leadership that we can produce quality livestock protein and, and reduce our emissions over time. Uh, Minister, I've got one more question here from the DFA, but I'm just going to take the moment, if I could please have the help of um, Dear Industry to grab some microphones from Alex at the back uh, to go to our questions here from the audience. Uh, you talk there about walk us walking the talk, but the thing is, is that um, the talk we have to walk is the geopolitical situation around China. The deer industry has invested their reserves in, in going hard into China over the COVID response and recovery for venison. So how does the government see the relationship with China developing? And what advice do you have on how our industries can risk management uh, this for our exporters? Look, we've got uh, a very mature and a very important relationship with China. We signed the free trade agreement, the first one with them um, in 2008, and then we've just signed the upgrade. It's a very important market for us, and it's a very significant market for the world. Um, but reliance on any one market, as you'll, you'll understand, you know, comes with risks. And so that's why we're keeping the doors open or um, you know, trying to open them wider in, in other markets. And clearly areas like the Middle East is another focus area for us off the back of Expo where we've had some good connections and we need to go back and, and keep working on those. Um, you know, what I'd say to any exporter is to, just to be mindful that, you know, at any one time we can have disruptions. I mean, COVID's woken us up to that, um, but we've had smaller disruptions in the past. We've just got to be able to, I guess, I hate to use the word pivot, you know, but that's to, to be able to shift um, both the kind of products that we're exporting and the markets that we're exporting to. Um, that's probably the reality of the world we're in. That's why we work and trade to keep as many doors as open as possible. Now I'll go to the audience. Who's got some questions for the minister? We've got some time. Fantastic. Can I just in relation to um, New Zealand's sort of statistics on mental health and suicide, and then to link that in with the current sort of challenges and and pressures through prescriptive legislation on rural communities and farmers, um, 
what is the current government going to be putting in place to assist with the sort of mental stability within our rural communities and our farmers to be able to get through these challenging times? Um, look, I, I think the whole world's, um, you know, faced some pretty challenging times. And actually, um, as sectors, um, you know, and as a country, we've fared better than most. The fact that most farmers have been able to continue to run their business pretty much in a normal way over the last 12 months has, has been an, an advantage. That doesn't mean to say there aren't pressures. We've always got pressures, I guess, around climate and, and you know, or changing um, uh, weather conditions, probably not climate so much, but um, you, and, and the market situation. Uh, there was a report came out, and I just read of it the other day, saying actually that where the real pressure has occurred over years has actually been with farm workers um, more than farmers, or that's where we've seen some of the terrible statistics. And we've got to work hard, I guess, to help one another. We've put money into mental health and, and that some of that will be going directly into rural mental health. We keep funding uh, the Rural Support Trust to give us advice as to where we need to put more money and help out, um, and that will continue. Um, and, and I guess that helping one another over the fence is probably the best way. It's not possible from anyone from Wellington or you know even uh, from the local hospital or DH to get out and, and provide the support when we know it might be needed. And that's often through neighbours, through local communities, uh, where we do have to help one another. And, uh, you know, the challenges of, of farming and doing whatever uh, will continue. And I guess that resilience, which is, a, you know, another trendy word I don't like using, but it's it's kind of part and parcel of the way forward. And I guess if, if the pressure um, on our farming enterprises, we've got to make sure there's some headroom from financial pressure perspective. You know, that's often at the forefront of pressure on farmers. Um, and in terms of farm workers, you know, maybe it's the hours of work or whatever. We, we've just got to keep looking um, over our shoulder, looking across the fence and helping one another. Um, it's the world we live in. And uh, I was reminded just again today that people in the cities probably don't appreciate the travel times and, and the distance from help that, that most rural people face. And, and we're the only ones that really understand that. And we're the ones that help, have to help one another out to get through that. A question, Mark. Uh, this is a supplementary question to the afforestation uh, question. First up, um, sig significant amounts of land that have been sold for planting in recent times are not for forestry for harvest. Therefore, for uh, their carbon plantings, carbon carbon credits uh, of which it's never going to be harvested in ten to fifteen to twenty years time. Uh, they're going to contribute nothing to New Zealand's GDP apart from a trade on the ETS and are going to be significant hazards with basically weeds, environmental, all sorts of problems and are going to be uh, going to become really problematic environmentally uh, while producing nothing for our country during that period and probably no further um, gain beyond that point because to, to put it into pastoral farming again, should that be the desire, is prohib prohibitive in cost. So is there any thought to controlling that for the for the long-term vision of our country? Um, I mean, there will be gain. That's why people are investing in it, and we have to acknowledge that. Um, some of them might be taking a bit of a gamble on the price of carbon, um, but they think that's a better use of the land than something else. So you have to assume there's a business case around that. People don't put that money in, you know, for, for ridiculous reasons. Um, that things may change. I accept uh, what you say, that some of that it will be in the wrong place. And one of the discussions that we had just yesterday again um, was on, on the value, the relative value of Indigenous versus uh, Radiata when it comes to some of that steep hill country. You can't have, in my view, a permanent uh, radiata forest. Uh, not in our country anyway. It will continue to grow, eventually fall over, and if it's on steep country, it brings with it, you know, env environmental harm and uh, when it falls over. So uh, we're working through those issues. Uh, again, it comes back to the one of um, intervention um, on in, in private property rights about saying, no, you shouldn't invest in that. We don't think you'll make money. Um, we we don't think it's good. Um, we're trying to find the right balance between, I guess, the freedom of decision making that many landowners want, and then the one of what we think is is best for the country and land use over time. And so it is around the land use classes. Um, and and while we would probably 
don't, we don't want um, radiata planted on one, two, three, four, and, and maybe five, um, and we don't want necessarily on eight on the steepest country. So maybe there's a band in there, which actually is where most of it is occurring now, but there will be areas, and I agree with you, where people planting for permanent forests, uh, it's not suited, um, and we're keeping an eye on that, and, to, and we will make adjustments to make sure we don't end up with an environmental kind of um, liability over time. Minister, delighted to hear about the other countries looking at us in terms of the ETS, but I note that Minister Shaw has been saying this for about four years, that everybody else is interested in what we're doing. Nobody's actually done anything except through subsidies, and how can I not say they've been telling us since the mid-80s that they will follow us with subsidies, and nobody has. So are we not in danger of going down exactly the same path where we take a hit, and then for this one, it could be irrevocable? Um, look, I, I don't think so. I think you heard from the US where you might not have believed it 12 months ago that they are going to, you know, halve their emissions or that's their target by 2030. That's a very ambitious target. And I think, you know, we have to take that with a pinch of salt. I guess um, we've had to progress with our trade and negotiations on the basis that, that if, if we do it, then they should follow. Um, you know, they haven't always. And, and uh, as a small country, we haven't really had too many options. Uh, we don't have much leverage. Um, so leading by example is the best way that we've achieved progress in many, many situations. Um, the countries that we're talking to in terms of EU and UK, um, the UK in particular makes a lot of um, statements in regard, in regard to um, climate change and their, their ambitions. In fact, most countries across the world now, um, Ireland just being the most recent, is committed to the 10% reduction by 2030 um, across agriculture and, and to be effectively carbon neutral by 2050 uh, as a country. And, and I guess so... so those are the general targets. You're right. We've got to make sure that that, that other countries, um, you know, match um, their targets and, and keep up to them. And I guess we've got it's quite a challenge to do that ourselves. So, but we have very few alternatives. We have to lead by example and hope that others follow. So I just repeat that they are being subsidised to do what they say they might be able to do, and we are not. That's and correct. not that anybody I, wants subsidies. Do you want to go back? Do you want uh, subsidies? No, Jeffrey? I just said not that anybody. I've only ever spoken to one farmer who actually wanted subsidies. But the fact is that we're making promises that will be very difficult to achieve. And other countries are making promises that they are then being subsidised to achieve. And that leaves us hung out to dry. No, I don't think they'll be difficult to achieve at all. I think that actually through good practice. I guess if you've gone back to the 80s when we were told that we were going to have half the number of sheep and have the same production, people would have laughed at you. If you look at some of the technologies that are emerging um, around uh, agriculture uh, through the GRA, uh, even just here in New Zealand and, and emissions reduction, I, I think we can meet the targets. We haven't set the targets for um, um, reduction from agriculture you know, to 2050. We have for 2030. Um, um, and I think we'll get there. And, and so, again, if we can lead by example, uh, we will be banging on the door, as we always do, for them to remove subsidies. And it's part of the WTO reform. We want fishery subsidies removed. We want fossil fuel subsidies removed. And we want agricultural subsidies removed because it, it does distort the market and it makes it harder, actually, for third world countries to come in, particularly in agriculture, and to build up an industry. So there's a lot of good reasons for us to continue banging on that door and and I guess we've always believed, you know, for a long time um, that, that, you know, leading by example, you know, can generate some progress. Minister, I have a question from Richard Cook online. Given that government policies um, seem to be reducing wealth creation opportunities, oil and gas development, live animal export ban, uh, and opportunities for adding value are being made more difficult with increasing costs such as minimum wage, sick leave, etc. Uh, could you please tell us how right now any policies are increasing wealth creation? 
I think all of the things that we're doing, if we want to go and look at the general export uh, revenue, say it's down 1%, but um, it looks really positive going forward. The issue is the, the, the stickiness of that wealth. And one of the things I raise is that, um, you know, often if money is paid out through wages, that money flows around through our economy. If it's paid to banks, it often goes offshore and, in, in, um, you know, huge profits. Um, there are a number of ways of creating wealth and then retaining it within our economy. And, and uh, I guess that's why, um, you know, the companies like Fonterra, that is a cooperative that keeps that money and pays that out through the farming sectors and all through our communities is a good model going forward. I don't believe that, that we are constraining. I believe what we're doing is looking to the future and future-proofing um, what, we, what we are doing here. And, um, you know, where we identify uh, a challenge or a problem, and it might be around climate emissions, uh, it might be around water quality, it might be around animal welfare, we've got to make changes to ensure that we're not undermined um, by some story in the market or by images or by the reality that we can't match up to what we say with our products. Um, so we believe that, you know, and, and I guess, you know, some of these things are always hard. Change is hard, but if we don't make the changes now, it will be harder in the future. Any further questions? And we'll just say, uh, make this the last question as we're just running out of time. Thanks. Yeah, Minister, you um, knocked live exports on the head uh, on, on animal welfare grounds, yet you uh, and that was your rationale, um, but you, you're still allowing uh, pork imports into New Zealand that, that are um, produced under conditions that we don't allow here. So what, what's the rationale behind that? Um, I, I guess it's trade and it's non-tariff trade barriers. And um, one of the issues that the UK has raised as a potential um, requirement for trade, it, it is around animal welfare standards. Um, I... I you know, said be careful what you ask for here. It's not currently a, a condition under WTO or endorsed by WTO. If we're going to get into animal welfare standards um, as a condition of trade, then it becomes very, very subjective. Um, animals out um, roaming around in pasture uh, and, and not having shelter, you know, when a storm comes might be seen as a negative animal welfare issue. Um, on the other hand, you know, keeping animals contained in a pen inside might be seen as negative. I, I'm not going to make a judgment on that other than to say that there are different farming systems around the world. Each of us makes judgment on what we believe is, is the right standard of animal welfare. Um, and, and we, you know, we should implement those standards, and I think we do. And if we can be proud of those, we can go out on the front foot and say that you know we we are um, you know we're adhering to the to the values of sentience, um, and and that we will look after animals. But most of them spend their time outside, and that's great. Most of them seem to enjoy it. Uh, come back to the point around pork production. Uh, you know that is a tricky one, but um, in the end, um, intervening on pork on the basis that you know we don't believe uh, the animal welfare standards are up, up to speak. Um, it is quite a challenge through WTO. Uh, we don't you know, support those things. Ultimately, it should be through the consumers, and I support, as we have done, the country of origin labelling. And consumers ultimately are more and more aware of what they buy, and, and they you know, probably over time will only be buying um, animal protein from systems that have the highest animal welfare standards. And that's where hopefully we will be the winners. Thank you very much for your time, Minister. And uh, just to end on that, here's hoping the country of origin labelling um, bill continues to proceed uh, forward as it's a huge part of where we're going forward if we're going to be able to prove uh, our systems that we do here in New Zealand. Really appreciate your time, Honourable Minister oh, Damien O'Connor.